Very briefly, I'm going to touch on the organization and what it's done, very briefly. And then we're going to be joined by George Sarkeesian with a clarinet solo, and then Hoodie Jacobs is going to give you much more information on the fabulous Herosa Mart. Just as a personal introduction, I've been with this organization for 40 years because I fell in love with Ivanitsi and her parents and her grandparents. And it, it gave me the passion not only to be married to her, but to, to serve the organization and some of the affiliated organizations I was drawn into, be it the ARF, be it the church, the senior citizens, different things that all of you have been involved in one way or another. But that passion came from the fact that there were immigrants, there were people that came, and as they say in my coupon business, it's a limited time offer. It has to do with your DNA, who your grandparents were, what they did, what they taught you, what they educated you on. And fortunately, organizations, one of which is the Vasco da Gama Society, came to life in this country 80 years ago combined with people from Boston and Detroit and its leadership, they formed chapters that, amazing. Only the Hudias could disagree. But we had like 12 different names for this organization in all the different cities from Chicago to Niagara Falls to Boston, New Jersey, uh, LA, San Francisco, you name it. And it survived. But like anything else, it's a limited time offer. And we've been able to support schools, uh, orphanages, intellectuals in Lebanon, activities both foreign and locally when we've helped, whether it's the Armenian schools here or an event that's going on with the church or the Ladies Guild or the ARF or the Knights of Artan. All of our people, Armenians and Vanatsis, particularly Vanatsis, have been involved in leadership positions and contributing to that. I'd just like to say that, like anything else, if you, if you read anything these days, the churches, particularly in the Detroit area, have diminished. Uh, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and everybody. Everything is limited time, and I don't know how long our time is going to be. But I just want you to know that we've existed this far, we've done very well, and we intend to keep going. And with your support, uh, we will do that. At this time, I'd like to invite George Sarkeesian.
invite elaborate on the second half of our program, which is the footy. Today I'm just going to give you a very short portion of the Hero Samar and make it more personal, how it affected people and things that happened. Uh, the other day I was watching something from National Geographic. I can't watch those shows very often because they're so cruel. Nature is cruel. And I was thinking, you know, this is how it is when it's just the animals and they don't have the feelings that we have. Uh, it's the survival of the fittest and they're so cruel. But then I was reading the books about Hero Samar and it was just as cruel as what was happening in the ocean with the fish where their lives were constantly in danger. So today I'm going to talk about three different items about the Hero Samar. One of them is going to be, it was so ancient and so modern, things that were happening in Van. It was like a dichotomy. The other one was, what was the attitude of the people, the villagers mainly, and then how it changed. And the third part is about ordinary people. To be able to give this talk, I was looking at three books. One is by Onik Mkhitaryan. This was very interesting because he was the secretary of the Defense Council. So not only did he have to take minutes, but he also had to uh, keep a diary of what was going on. So he gives a lot of details about it. The next one was Haig Gosoyan. He was a teacher. He was also a member of the Defense Council. And the third one was a Kurazi. He was from Shushans. And this one was very interesting because I had never read this one before. Keram Vartanian was his name. And what's so interesting about him is that he, not only does he tell everything from the villagers' point of view, but he was also one of those who, after the defense fell, well, the defense was fine, but afterwards when uh, they had to leave, he went through Iraq. And um, this would have been very important for a lot of us because that's how our parents came here. They went through Iraq while some of them went to Armenia. So his book was very interesting. He was 18 years old at the time, so he knew exactly what was going on. So the first one is ancient yet modern. Now, you can't get any ancient than Van. It was Urardu before. It was the capital of Urardu. One time I was giving a talk to some American friends, and one of them came afterwards and, say, and said, here you are standing here, and you are talking to us of ancient times. And she was sort of in awe of this. And this is how Van is when you look at it. It can't get any more interior in Asia Minor than Van. If you go a little, a few more miles, you're ending up in different countries. It's so far from Istanbul. It's so far from Europe. And yet, some of the things these people did was amazing. Now, this is kind of funny. My brother, Harad, comes over for Surj very often. And since we've been talking about, about Van, he keeps saying this. You know, he's the photographer. And he says, now, how did they have all these pictures? This is amazing. They had to have film. They had to have the chemicals to develop this. Well, it's, there's really more than that. They even built a cannon. They built powder for their cartridges, uh, getting everything together from the pharmacy, from the blacksmiths, from the jewelers. So everyone had something to do over there. So this was ancient, yet they were modern. You know, they had the chemicals. And I, being a teacher, I'm always amazed that they had a printing press. This is in the late 1800s. I mean, how many cities in Europe had that? Uh, and Istanbul, of course, had it. But not too many had the printing press. They had a school for girls. Now, that is really amazing. While people here couldn't, women couldn't even vote, they had a school for girls in Van at the time. So these were really awesome things. It was like a dichotomy. Um, they were the ones in the villages who would never revolt, no matter how hard their life got. And yet they were the ones who stood up to the Turks and who fought for a whole month until the Russian army arrived. So these were like opposites that were happening over there. When the Russian general Nikolaev got to Van after the defense and he took over, he wanted to see their facilities. And he went and he looked and he said, um, have some of you been in the army? They said, no. Have you been in the Russian army? No. 
have you been in any army? No. And yet everything they had done, they had been able to do warfare against a regular Turkish army and of course the Kurdish tribes that were coming at them. So these were awesome things about Van. They created a defense council and they created it in no time. This defense council had to take care of a city under siege. They had never taken care of a city before. They had never had a government before. And here's what they had to take care of. Not only war, but police, supplies of food, distribution of food, and plus all these migrating people coming from the villages so they wouldn't die. Like about 10,000 people came from the villages to, um, uh, to Van because they, were, they would have been killed otherwise. So there were a lot of things to worry about. Their health, their food, pestilence. I, a lot of things could happen when all these people were together. And I would like to read to you here some of the orders from this group. This was kind of interesting. Uh, they would all send out orders. And one of them was, verify all reports. Must be signed. The reports must be signed by leaders. And they are accountable for un unfounded rumor. Now you would think, why would they say that? But just think, here they are under siege in a little city. Someone with rumors could create panic. So there was a lot of wisdom with these people. And then they would say they needed shovels and picks, you know, for the ramparts and for, for the walls or for, for digging trenches. They would say, return them every night. Do not waste any ammunition because there wasn't enough ammunition. Make them count. And now the modern thought in this Never revile the religion of the enemy. Wouldn't you want Turks to have done that for us? But that wasn't to happen. So these were the dichotomies I was talking about the situation, what it was. Before the defense of Van started, the curatis, the villagers, were in the worst shape. In fact, in all of the interior, the curatis had the worst shape. In fact, someone had said that their lot was worse than that of the rabbits of their field. And the reason is, of course, the rabbits are defenseless, totally defenseless. They can't fight back, plus they can hide. So the villagers couldn't hide. Their problem was worse. So the Turks who had decided to annihilate the Armenians had different ways of doing this. For instance, they would come and they would say, well, there's the war going on. We need food. They would take the food. They would take livestock. And the villagers were, were left with nothing. There could be famine because of this. Uh, some other things that they did, they would come and say, we need soldiers. So they would take all the young men. But they didn't use them as soldiers. They would kill them, or they would, they would even beat them, or uh, they would abuse them uh, if, they were, if they kept them alive. They wouldn't give them enough food or clothing. So in every way, the villagers' lot was absolutely awful. But then things started to change. If you recall, we have talked about this before, Kharimian Haidik, who wrote to them and said, you have to defend yourself. Rafi, the writer, and so many others who would write. The political parties who came and brought guns and who trained them so that they could fight when there arose the need. So this is kind of a nice thing because um, they, were, they used to create so many songs, the villagers, and we see them in the Herapo Hagan songs, the revolutionary songs. And you can see the attitude changing. I'm, I'm going to read this for you. It says, the, um, this is from Erzurum song. The Armenian villagers hadn't seen swords and rifles. He left the field and he took the sword and rifle instead of the shovel. And this is what happened because of these men that were the heads of the Armenian people. But today, I'm not going to talk about them. We know a lot about them. We know about Aram Manuhian, how he organized the defense. And like I said, they lasted for about a month. And of course, they were the lucky ones because the Russian army came. Had it not been for the Russian army coming, we would have been totally annihilated. So Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem. And no one knew this young couple, just villagers, coming and the Messiah would be born of them. No one knew that. So God used ordinary people. Well, that's exactly what happened in Van. God used ordinary people. I'm going to talk about a few of them that you may never have heard of because I thought this was so personal and really so horrible, too. One of them was Shirin Hagopian. 
he was in one of the villages, and they had decided to get all the people from the villages together and to walk them to Aikestan, which is uh, a suburb of Van. Uh, by the way, there were two areas where they were, were fighting, Aikestan and Van. So he had to get these villagers together, so he was out working, he was not in his village. When the people from the village left, his wife was sick, so she couldn't leave. And so couldn't a lot of older people and some children, among them his four children. Well, he's out there helping the people, gathering all these people while his family's in the village. They went back trying to get them, but the village was surrounded. He couldn't get them out. So his wife and children died. They were killed. But he, this never stopped him. He took all these people, gathered them, and got them safely to Van. And then we see his name coming up more and more. He did this and he did that. He never, yeah, he was hurting, of course, but he never let it stop him. Another one was uh, in the village of Shushat, and this came from that Keram Vartanian's uh, book. Um, the villagers were, well, they didn't have many, <coughs> excuse me, they did not have many guns. But as you know, the Turkish soldiers would come and they would say, give us your guns, because they wanted to take them before massacring them. Well, they would come day after day and they would beat the men and they would break their bones. It was so bad that the villagers decided, let's get some old rifles together and give it to them so they leave us alone. But that did not satisfy them. This time they got all the men together and they started a huge bonfire. This is what the commander did. And he said, if you do not bring the guns to us, we are going to take these, um, the, 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 whatever, I, I guess it was skewers. They had put them in the fire. And they said, we're going to go, to go and burn your men if you don't do this. So everybody was scared to death, and they didn't know what to do. Well, lo and behold, a bunch of women come over there, Armenian women. They get their pails of water and dump it on the fire. And one of them, named Baizat, turns to this commander, and she's really mad at him. She says, if you keep this up, we're going down to the city to complain about you. This is when before, you know, the, the van uh, thing has started. Well, this man was taken aback, so he left. But she saved the life of these people. But, you know, when you think of the courage, here they are, they can do anything to you. And these women jumped up. I just want to show you that it wasn't just the men who were courageous, so were the women. Um, then we look at uh, at the defense itself, and we see the people working. The children, the young children, would go out there and get the cartridges, empty cartridges. At night, they would fill them up with powder, and in the morning, they would take those to the soldiers so they could fight, because they did not have enough ammunition. Uh, the women had uh, gotten groups together, so they would sew for the men. They would, they would, everybody was doing something, or they would help in the hospital. Uh, what I was really amazed about, there were these villagers who really couldn't fight. They didn't have guns. They didn't know how to fight. But they knew how to use a shovel. So they would dig the trenches for the people. And then they would build the walls with the help of the masons. They would help, help build walls or the ramparts. Well, every day, those ramparts would go down because the Turks were bombing and shooting at them. Every night, they would go and rebuild them. Well, it got so bad toward the end that they were getting ruined four or five times a day. And these men would still go out in the, with those bullets coming at them, and they would still rebuild them. And what was interesting, when one would die, the next one would take the place. It was like there was no fear. They were together. They were working together. The defense lasted from April 18 till May 15. And like I said, the Russian army came. Well, of course, this was great. But then the Russians had their own, what should I say, their own ideas about this. They wanted Armenia without Armenian. They pulled their army back. And so the people of Van had no recourse but to leave with them. So they went back to Armenia. But then some of them decided to come back because they thought they could still live there. And they came and they started building even and planting. But a lot of them died because the massacres began again. They started uh, killing them. So this time they left, some for Hayastan, and some of them, they were going to Hayastan, but they thought it was the roads were closed, so they went down to Iraq 
And this was a part where my parents, my parents, my father, and a lot of your uh, people probably came through. And then, of course, they went to Iraq and from on to Jerusalem and all of the all over the Middle East. Uh, the Vanities like Gurung. You played Gurung today, right? Didn't you play the crane? The, they they like the crane. The that's that's their bird. But today, I'm going to be finishing with a poem that's not about the Gurung, but it's about the swallow, which is a migrating bird, Zizernak in Armenian. And I want to read this to you because it's so much like us. The swallow was building its nest. He was singing and he was building. And every time he would add a twig, he would remember his old nest. He had built a nest once and he had repaired it many times. But this time when he returned, he found the nest in ruins. And now once again, he was building his nest and he was singing. And every time he added a twig, he remembered his old nest. The vanities, just like the rest of the Armenian, came back, tried to rebuild, but they found everything in ruins. Their nest was in ruins. So they went all over the world, and they built there. Even though they had this gaping wound in their hearts that would never go away, they still sang, they still danced, they built churches, they built schools, they built families, I mean, they, they raised families. The work still continues today. A few days before Thanksgiving, and I would like to thank those people who fought because that's the reason we are here today. But above, above all, I would like to thank the ordinary people, and that includes you, the ordinary people who worked so hard and who gave their lives and who are still doing that today. Thank you.